He was translated from South Africa to Wales to a mental world where he prayed for a girl who was healed. And then scientists in South Africa put the plague that was killing thousands of native Africans in his hand. They put it under a microscope and they watched the germ die. This is Dr. John G. Lake, his great ministry and his great life. I am Robert Slurden and this is God's Generals. Dr. John G. Lake is known for a great healing ministry, but in the beginning of his life, he writes that all his memories were, were sad memories. He writes that he remembers doctors and nurses and caskets and funerals and graveyards because many of his brothers and sisters died, and he remembers mainly in his childhood going to these type of sad events, and so sickness was a part of his life. When he finally got married, his wife had gotten sick, and his other brothers and sisters were getting sick, so it seemed like there was this curse on the family that everybody was getting sick and dying, and it concerned him. Even though in his life he tried to go to a Methodist training school, and they didn't teach him much about healing, obviously because his family kept staying sick and getting worse, but he heard about a man named John Alexander Dowie that had built a city 40 miles north of Chicago named Zion. And so he sent a telegram to Dr. Dowie saying, here's my wife's condition, Here's what my experience has been. Would you please pray? Could you do something about it? And Dr. Dowie had on his desk a prayer, a date machine. And it's a machine that when he got a request by letter or by telegram, he would pray for it and he would stick the, uh, the letter that, uh, that came to him and then hit it and would have the date on it and send it back to the person saying at this date and this time I prayed. Well, he received Lake's request for prayer for his wife and he prayed for him like he did all the other thousands of requests. And he hit the machine and sent the date back. And the letter said, or the telegram said, I prayed she'll live and not die. And that was it. And she lived and she did not die. So that was the first time in Dr. Lake's life that something supernatural had happened. And so when this began to be talked about around the town that Mrs. Lake was healed and up and normal and taking care of the family and cooking and the kids and all the things, they began to bring their sick members of their families and friends to John G. Lake's house and, and ask him, can you fix my family? Well, Lake didn't know anything about healing. So because of that pressure of all those friends and families in the neighborhood, he packed up his bags and he's packed up his family and he moved to Zion, Illinois to learn from Dr. Dowie what the healing ministry was and how he could be a part of God's healing plans for the nations. When he got there, it was the latter part of Dowie's life and he got a house in Zion because at this time it was probably about 20,000 citizens in Zion. A little interesting fact about who his neighbors were. He lived across the street from F.F. F. Bosworth, the man that would be known to write the book called Christ the Healer, have huge healing campaigns that I write about in one of my other general books that we'll talk about at a different time, but they were neighbors in Dowie City. And uh, Lake got there, became a, a respected member of the community, and he became a member of the board of the church under Dr. Dowie. And this is about the time when Dowie began to think that he was Elijah. And so John G. Lake knew that wasn't right, but he had something good about himself. He knew how to separate the good from the bad. So many of the times people, when somebody makes a mistake, we throw everything out, and that's a mistake. Immaturity does not pick what's right and pick what's wrong. Uh, immaturity just says, I don't believe and throws it out. Maturity says, this is good and this is bad. So Lake had enough maturity as a man and as a Christian to say, John G. Lake is going to take Dowie's good stuff and going to leave Dowie's bad stuff behind. And so eventually Dr. Dowie died and he left Zion and moved to Chicago. And he went back into business. Now, um, Lake's life, he was a very good businessman. He built a newspaper. Now he goes back to Chicago after the collapse of Zion and Dowie's death and begins to make a very profitable living, $50,000 a year. Now back in the early 1900s, $50,000 a year was a lot of money. And so that's what uh, he began to do. But then he heard about a happening in Los Angeles at Azusa Street. So Bosworth and Lake get on a train and they go to L.A. to see this phenomena of Pentecost. Uh, the Bible days are here again. Primitive Christianity had returned. These were the, the words they were using to describe Azusa Street. The, the faith of the apostles. They were speaking in tongues and prophesying and healing and deliverance. So Dowie believed in healing. 
but he didn't believe in the Holy Spirit baptism of speaking in tongues. He thought that was kind of too far, but you know, take the good and leave the bad. So they went out there and they found a little black man named William J. Seymour, the first pastor of the modern Pentecostal movement. And John G. Lake said to William Seymour that he had the strangest vocabulary, but had the greatest sense of the presence of God that he felt on anybody up to that time in his life. While he was out there, they were able to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit and became a part of the early Pentecostal movement. When that had all come to an end of their visit, they came back to Chicago. And a little while goes by and God visits Lake and God tells him to go to South Africa. The Pentecostal movement had just been born and John G. Lake was going to be the first one to enter the African field with building a Pentecostal denomination in South Africa called the Apostolic Faith. How he got there is a great story. He had no contacts. He just had received a vision. And in this vision, the Lord spoke to him to go to South Africa. All he had was his wife and his children and one other ministry family was going to go with him. So he got in the mail the money that he needed to go uh, to buy the tickets on the boat to go to South Africa. There was no jets in those days. There was just the old ocean liners. So he would go through Great Britain and then on down into, into Africa and then to South Africa. There was a lady in South Africa, a well-to-do family. One morning she woke up and the Lord said to her, go to the port there in, in, in South Africa, I believe it was Durban, and uh, there'll be a missionary family with the right amount of children and they'll be from America and you're to give them this house. She had several homes and so she packed up her little bags and she got in a horse and carriage and she headed down to uh, the port there in South Africa and she waited for the right boat to come off. She didn't know you know, when it was supposed to come, they said the Lord told her to go. So she got there and she found that the name of the boat she had in her spirit was there. And she got there at the, at the, the dock and waited for the people to come off. And she kept asking the families, are you a missionary? How many children do you have? And they didn't meet the criteria. You're not the one. She kept pushing them through until she came to John G. Lake. She asked, are you a missionary from America? He goes, yes, I am. How many children do you have? He announced how many children he had. You're the one, come with me. I have a house for you and your family for you to start your ministry here. God had made a way for John G. Lake to come with a wife and young children all the way to South Africa, got off the boat, and he did not know in the natural where they were gonna sleep, who they were gonna meet, or what to do. All he had was the word of the Lord. Now, in the early days of Pentecost, and the early days of this kind of missionary fervor, this is what they did. They didn't have connection. They didn't have people that they knew. A lot of them just felt, God called me to China. God called me to South America, to Africa, someplace. And they went. In Pentecost, when they believed they spoke in tongues, they also believed God would give them a language of some tribe or some people in the earth, which meant they were called to go there. So if it sounded African, they'd buy a ticket and go to Africa, get off the boat and start praying in tongues. And if someone said something back to them, then they realized connection had been made and they'd follow that person to their tribe and start their mission work. That's how early Pentecostals went around the world. Now, us today, we get all nervous. We get, oh, well, we can't do that. We don't know anybody and we don't believe that. But this is how it worked. And if God did it then, he can do it again today if we have enough guts to go and believe and see what happens. So Lake met his... His, his salvation of his house. The lady was there and said, I've got you a house. It was a nice big Victorian house, enough for the children, enough for the family, enough for the other family to stay with them for a while and they found their own home. And so Lake landed with the first step of provision. When he got there, he began to preach and began to just do the ministry as he knew to do. And it began to work because people were getting healed. The healing ministry was very young in these days. Very few people had ever heard about divine healing or miracles. They knew they'd happened in the long time ago in the Bible days, and they thought, well, those is what God did to get the Christianity going. But once it got going, you know, miracles ceased because you didn't need it anymore. Well, that's the side of religion. The gospel is always confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles. And in church history, if you study it, when uh, religious people took control, they replaced signs, wonders, and miracles with ceremony, ritual, and tradition. And any time it replaces signs, wonders, and miracles, everybody starts dying, they start complaining, they start griping, they get all fussy over stupid things that matter to nothing about people's natural life or their eternal life. So Lake starts preaching and praying for the sick and miracles start happening. Here's one of the stories that I've found most, most amazing and and uh, exciting that uh, during the time that he was there, there was a great plague that came through South Africa. 
And uh, remember, medicine is not what it is today back then. And so the native of Africans begin to die by the thousands and the white Africans that were there also were dying and, and they were scared to bury the dead. And so people would just die and they would be staying in their homes and that's not a good thing to happen. And so Lake was out saying, if you guys won't bury the dead, I'll go, go dig the graves and perform the services and, and, and bury the dead. Because other preachers were scared to do it. They were scared that if it got around it, to get on them and kill them. And, and so the scientists and the doctors noticed that this uh, missionary was out there digging graves and burying those that had died a few days before, or a few hours ago. And, and they said, man, don't do that. You're gonna die. And Lake said, I will not die. He says, the law of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law of sin and death. He says, when that disease touches me, it dies because the law of life is more powerful than the law of death. And they said, man, you're just fanatical. That's not true. He says, well, I'll put you to the test. Take some of the saliva of the dead people here and put it on my hand and then put it my hand under the microscope and watch what happens to the germs that killed these people. He said, I will guarantee you it will die and I will not. Well, since he was so adamant about it and he was the only one bearing the dead and you know, scientists are, are always inquisitive. They said, okay, they did it. So they went and found a person that had died and, and got some of the saliva out of their mouth and put it on his hand and, and they put it, his hand in the microscope with the saliva there and they watched the germs stop moving and die. And they repeated that on different bodies. They went and got saliva from different people that had been dead for so long or just died. And they tried it in different ways. And each time they did it, the germ died under the microscope. And to say the least, John G. Lake kept burying the dead and doing the funeral services and he did not die. He had a revelation that the law of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. Now he also made a statement that I think would be appropriate to stay here is he said that sickness is small doses of death. He viewed every illness, no matter how dramatic it may be or how small it was, was a dose of death. And he goes, if you get too many doses, you die. And he says, but the law of life in Christ Jesus set you free from all of the doses of death. And so that was one that lived very strong in his heart. And so he had that revelation where he did not have any fear of disease. Disease probably feared him because when he came, it had to leave, it had to die. Another story of him in South Africa with the miracle power was he was out preaching to the native Africans. And uh, in those days, they didn't do the mass prayer where you pray one prayer over the crowd and the Spirit of God sweeps in and begins to heal. They didn't quite understand that. So they still believed they had to touch each person individually. And so Lake had grown very tired of physically, couldn't keep praying for everybody because he was tired. And plus he had other appointments to go to and the crusade was going and he had nobody to give it to. So. He told all the native people there was a tree stump that had fallen over and I guess they had sawed it in two or something. He goes, I'm gonna lay my hands on this tree stump and I'm gonna ask God to put the anointing that's upon me right now to pray for you into this tree stump so that if you come by and believe God to heal you, then when you touch this, you'll get healed. See, it's not me that you need to have faith in, it's faith in Christ. And so he prayed for this tree stump and asked God to take the anointing that's upon him at that time, put it on this, on this tree and when the people touched it, God healed them, touched them. He says, because I can't go any further, I'm exhausted. And so he, he got on his horse and went on back to town and left the people and they began to touch it. He thought, you know, maybe in a couple of hours it'll all go away. He got, uh, someone came, they didn't have phones in those days. So uh, a runner had to come and say, uh, Pastor Lake, John Lake, w would you come back? The crowd's bigger and they're still touching the tree and they're still getting healed. So he gets on his horse and, and his few friends and go back out to where he left them. And the crowd was double the size and people were still rushing to touch the tree where he had prayed and they were still getting healed. Now, I know some of you might think, well, that's, that's not right. Well, not right, whatever it happened. And you know, God can do signs, wonders, and miracles. And the Bible talks about special or different kinds of miracles. God can do anything He wants to do the way He wants to do it. You know, and I think sometimes we need that wild faith again. We have too much Western civilized, you know, sophisticated faith. Have wild faith about it. Believe God for anything and let God do it. They had many miracles in South Africa and great stories to go forth. And um, he also had built the apostolic faith denomination is still going strong in South Africa today. I think when he left, he had 500 native churches that he established and over a hundred uh, white churches. Remember in those days, the whites and the natives did not work together. They were separate. And uh, so 
great success happened, but there's a sad point that must be made about Lake's life. Now, sometimes when I tell some of the negative or a sad thing, people get mad at me for it, but we don't tell these stories so that we can criticize, but so that we can learn. The Bible says in Corinthians that things are written about the children of Israel that we could learn today of how to be better and to learn from their mistakes. While in South Africa, what brought his ministry to an end, even though the ministry that he built kept going, but he came back to America, was his wife died. His wife died in South Africa of malnutrition and exhaustion. Uh, this brings a point that I want to make about ministry. A lot of times people do not take responsibilities for their family as they should, which was one of Lake's mistakes here. He did not take charge of his home as he should and put things in order so that his wife could rest and his wife could be properly fed. And the ministry was so demanding upon the, of all of them, all over the team, all of the people there, that eventually it brought her to the end of her life prematurely. The sad part of that, it gets worse. The children by the first wife, John Lake's first wife, blamed him until the day they died that he killed their mother. Now, I know that's not true in, in a way, but that's the way the children felt until they died themselves. They died still talking about their pain and their anger and their frustration with their dead over their mother dying in South Africa. So the point that I want to make right now, the priority of God is God, you and God's relationship, you and your family, then you and your ministry. That's the order that God wants it to be in. If it's out of that order, it's not right. So let's make sure that as we go into ministry, if you want to keep a happy family, put God first, put them second, and then your ministry and your work third. If it's any other way, you're gonna have trouble. When we come back, we're gonna talk about his ministry in America after he leaves South Africa. It's a great ministry. The healing rooms are gonna come alive in a new way. After Lake returned to South Africa to pick up his children, they all got back on the boat and came back to America, which begins the next part of his life and his ministry. He has to find a place to call home. He goes out to the West Coast, to the state of Washington, to the city of Spokane, where he remarries and has some new children by his second wife and raising the children of the first wife. And he decides to start a certain type of ministry that he kind of learned under Dowie's ministry from Zion. He called them the healing rooms. And what the healing rooms were, they were places where people would come and they would uh, get like a doctor's appointment or an appointment to meet with one of the healing technicians. Now a healing technician was a person that John G. Lake had personally trained on how to heal the sick. He had got several of them together. We have a picture here that you're seeing. This is a group of the healing technicians that he had trained personally. And what he would do, he would teach them the Bible, teach them what he learned about praying for the sick and getting results. And then their final test would be, he would send them out to somebody that had called in that was sick and they could not come back to the school until they were healed. And that was their final test before they graduated to become a healing technician with him in the healing rooms. So some would go out and get them healed in the first hour, some would be a couple of days, but when they got them healed, they came home. And that was how you graduated from his training into becoming a minister of healing in the healing rooms. So now that he's got his healing technicians and those he's trained all ready to go, people come. They have all types of diseases. I'm in a wheelchair. Some will come in a wheelchair. Some will need canes because they couldn't walk. Their legs are weak. All kinds of troubles. They'd come into the healing rooms and they would be taken into a small room and one of the healing technicians would come in, sit down and diagnose what the physical problem was, where they were at spiritually, and then decide what they needed to get healed. How many scriptures, what scriptures, how much prayer, and they would tell them now, between now and your next appointment, we want you to read these verses, pray like this, do this, and then come back, and then we will uh, diagnose how far you've come along or what you need to, uh, to do to, to get your healing. And so they keep walking them all the way through until they got healed. Now, you say, well, that's kind of strange. Well, strange or not, he had 100,000 documented miracles in five years. Now, there's one thing that when you're in a healing campaign and people come up and they're not needing their cane no more and, and we think it's great and exciting, but then sometimes people lose their healing, as it said. They say they lost their healing. Well, because sometimes people's emotions can move them to a point where they think they're okay. But when you have 100,000 documented miracles in five years, there's no emotional aspect to those kind of records. So Lake, did something phenomenal. He knew how to teach his people how to heal the sick and then walk the sick all the way through to their miracle. 
That's what Dawei did in Zion. That's what a lot of the healing ministers did in the early part of the Pentecostal movement. Now, another phenomenal thing that happened to Lake at this time was Spokane, Washington was declared the healthiest city in America at this time. The mayor of the city said that uh, there was two reasons why they'd received this award from Washington, D.C. was because of the medical people, the doctors and the nurses there in Spokane. And what the doctors and nurses could not do or could not cure, John G. Lake's healing rooms could do it. And so I find it very exciting that the mayor of a city recognized the medical field and the divine healing field. Now, most of the time, these two worlds were separated. But in Spokane at this time, at least in the mayor's heart, they put those together. Now, a lot of early Pentecostals didn't believe in doctors. They didn't believe in medicine because, as Dowie would say, it was an inexact science. Many times people went to the doctors, they got worse, kind of like the woman in the Bible, spent all she had and grew worse. But I do believe that medicine and prayer can work together. Like uh, one preacher said, medicine kept you alive long enough not to need it anymore. Because as you build your faith, then you don't need the medicine. John G. Lake made another statement that I'd like to talk about just for a moment that may provoke your thoughts. He said he did not like the big healing ministry gifts. Like in our day, we'd say like Benny Hinn or Catherine Kuhlman, because he felt like it robbed people from developing their individual faith that helped them able to get miracles consistently in their life. Because when you see the big healing gifts or the healing ministries, you become dependent upon them. And he says he saw that become an enemy to people's everyday faith. So I kind of agree with John G. Lake in that way. So let me explain it so you don't get mad at me or him for a moment. It's great that we have Catherine Kuhlman. It's great that there's a Benny Hinn. There's great that these are George Jeffries. It's great that we have these gifts. But what if Benny Hinn's not in your city? What if Catherine Kuhlman's gone now and she's in heaven and she's no longer in her white dress singing hallelujah, getting you healed? What are you going to do? sit there and suffer and wish you could get healed or wish a healer would come by when Jesus is the healer and he heals anybody anywhere in the world where faith is released. If we can develop our individual faith in God's word and learn how to get our miracles ourselves without the assistance of another gift, it's far better. That way you have it yourself wherever you go in the world and you're not a dependent person. A lot of people today live as a dependent Christian and not an independent Christian. And that is one of the challenges. John G. Lake ministered and taught people in his churches and those who are connected to his ministry how to develop their faith and get miracles on their own without having to have a signs and wonders ministry gift come by and fix them. I hope you'll do the same thing. Many of us are waiting for Benny to come to town or some famous hitter to come to town and I'm not against them, but I'd rather have you know how to believe chapter and verse build your faith and get healed. I knew John G. Lake's daughter the last few years of her life, and she gave me all of his unpublished sermons. And I put them in a big book. You'll see the book on the screen here, of over a thousand pages of Dr. Lake's sermons. And I hope that you'll get the book and read them, because there's very powerful sermons he has in them on healing and how to develop your faith. And the, one, the point that I want to make as I begin to close today, the first sermon that I have in this book is called The Spirit of a Martyr. And he believed the reason why his success in ministry and those with him in South Africa was successful was because they gave up everything for the cause of Christ. There's a story that he tells that the money for his support for his mission had gotten very low and he couldn't give them the money to buy their food and take care of them. So he called all of his missionaries in South Africa back to the base and, and told them that he'd rather have them there than out there on the field where he couldn't support them. And then all the missionaries he had called in, asked him to leave the room and he walked out for two hours and had a cup of coffee, he said, and he came back in and found the room with the chairs in a circle and a communion table at the front. And the missionaries in there asking him to sit in the center of the circle. And they said, we've all made a commitment to God and to one another, and now we make it to you. That we want to be sent back out to our post on the mission fields here in Africa. We have to walk. Some of us don't have enough money for gas in the cars or for a horse to take us. We'll walk. And some did walk for three days. And if we die out there preaching the gospel, the only, only thing we ask is that you preach our funeral. And he said that spirit of martyrdom, as he called it, is what made them successful. Some of them walked two or three days. He did some of their funerals, but they died in faith and they died happy. There's so much to talk about John G. Lake and to do it in 30 minutes is almost impossible. But let's recap this for a few moments. We talked about Lake's call into, into healing 
almost by accident because he saw a man who believed in healing pray for his wife and she got healed. And because of the need, it pushed him into ministry. And then we see him had a vision from God and go to South Africa without anything but a word from God. Many times, that's how God leads us. He gives us a word. He tells us, go do this. I want you to do that. That's all you've got is a word. And you create something out of that word. Then Lake made a mistake by not knowing how to take care of his family in South Africa. And we lost his first wife. So let's make sure if you're married, that's a priority. If you have children, that's a priority. Do not allow uh, the busyness and the demand of the public to take away from the personal priorities of your life of God, family, and then ministry. And then we also see that he knew how to work with the city of Spokane. He also knew how to make a personal commitment. There is a writing that he wrote about his consecration to Christ. In between uh, his return from South Africa to America, he decided to make a written declaration of how he would commit himself to Christ. And he wrote down several points of how he'd treat man, how he'd honor God with his life and avoid sins and so forth and so on. Every one of us needs to have that personal consecration that we may be able to be able to stand against all the accolades and all the persecutions. And I want to pray for you right now that God will speak to you in a way that will create a moment in your life for it to be a defining moment where you'll make a decision to live for him in an honorable way, a powerful way, and a way that you'll always be glad that you made this commitment at this time in your life. I pray for you right now that all the voices around you will go quiet and that God's voice will be heard clear and distinctly inside of you. I command him ambition to lay down and let the vision of God take its place. And I pray for you to keep the priorities of God in your life and keep the priorities of how God wants you to treat man in your life. And I command all the other pulls to cease and for there be clarity and strength and focus in your life and in your ministry. I pray that for you in Jesus' name.